to the 14th session of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies Decolonizing Europe event. My name is Beste Ishleyan, and I am the co-convener of this series together with my colleague Tasnim Anwar. And today I'm really happy uh, to be hosting uh, the second session of our mini series on uh, decolonizing Eastern Europe, which we co organize uh, with the help of uh, Zoltan uh, Ginelli. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Zoltan uh, for helping us uh, to bring this uh, panel together. Um, so we had our first session in uh, February. You can uh, find this session as well as the other videos of uh, our in our series on the YouTube channel of the Amsterdam uh, Institute for Social Science Research. So in this session, we continue our uh, discussion all on uh, how decoloniality is related to the eastern part of Europe. And with our speakers, we will explore the theoretical and political affiliations between dependency uh, theory world systems analysis and decoloniality. We will seek to recenter the European East in decolonial thought while decolonizing the category of Eastern Europe. So I am really, really happy to be hosting two distinguished uh, colleagues today uh, for this session, and I would like to introduce our speakers to you. So our first speaker is uh, Manuela Boatka, who is professor at the University, professor of sociology at the University of Freiburg. Uh, Manuela does research on global inequalities, uh, multiple and unequal Europe's and the Caribbean. Uh, she is the co-editor of Decolonizing European Sociology, as well as of Global, Multiple and Postcolonial Modernities. Uh, and she is also the author of uh, Neo-Evolutionism to World Systems Analysis. So our second speaker is Ovidio Tikindelanu, who is a philosopher and cultural theorist writing on critical social theory, decolonial thought, alternative epistemologies, and the cultural history of post-communism. And he is editor of the magazine Idea Arts uh, Plus Society and coordinator of the Decolonial Thinking Research Group at uh, Binghamton University, New York. And his recent, most recent publications include a co-edited co-audit, book, uh, which is entitled Romanian Revolution uh, Televised, Contributions to the Cultural History of Media, as well as a co-edited book, which is uh, entitled The Anti-Communist Illusion. Welcome, our speakers. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being with us and for your time. So I would like to start with a broader question. Uh, so both of you in your work have explored uh, the political and theoretical affiliations between dependency theory, world system analysis, and decoloniality. Uh, and this is uh, in line with your attempts to recenter the European East. Um, Manuela has addressed this in relation to a wide range of topics, including but not limited to the notion of se semi-periphery, the development of underdevelopment, uh, and structural transformation of the capitalist order. So my question to both of you is as a, as a kickoff question, in which ways does a decolonial engagement with the world systems uh, theory and dependency theory contribute to our understanding of European East and its structural position uh, also from an historical perspective? Um, so I do not have an order in mind. Um, Manuela, would you like to start? Yes, sure. Well, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, ACES, for this wonderful series and um, to um, the organizers of this particular session for inviting us and, and for um, Zoltan to, um, to have proposed this extra um, focus on Eastern Europe. Um, and I think the first um, important point to make is that, as maybe um, people have noticed, the Eastern in our title is in inverted commas the um, title of the session, because we are talking about constructions and against generalizations of um, regional blocks and kind of refight um, positionalities. So in this sense, I think uh, to answer your question, the most important uh, contribution that I think um, an understanding of the East of Europe has from a world systems and, and decolonial perspective is that um, it, we conceive theoretical genealogies and also political affiliations more clearly between dependency theory, world systems analysis, and decoloniality. Um, one very obvious thread weaving through these three traditions is the figure, the towering figure, we could say, of Aníbal Quijano, who was both a dependency theorist and a world systems um, analysis 
of theorists later, um, as well as one of the main proponent, uh, proponents of decoloniality. But the genealogies are beyond the personal figure or beyond uh, personal contributions. And I think it is very clear um, how important regions are to understand in this context when we think of how world systems analysis uh, defines Latin America and Eastern Europe as the first peripheries of the modern world system. And the fact that these two regions, very broadly defined and understood as constructions, because they were both political constructions, the Latin, in Latin America is a French political project, and the Eastern in Eastern Europe has to do with many factors, one of which is kind of agricultural production as a, a common factor. But both were incorporated in the capitalist world economy as regions characterized by coerced labor. And if we see them through this prism, um, if we see any of them through this prism, we no longer connect them in a regional or fragmented or partial um, framework. We don't see Latin America as part of the Americas or um, the lesser America, so to say. And we don't only see the East of Europe as the lesser Europe or the other Europe, but we see both in a global framework and through the lens of how they contributed to the capitalist world economy. And that um, also has to do with the fact that um, seeing this through a global perspective um, illuminates the way that their contributions uh, were even possible. Because a lot of the dependency theory um, contributions to world systems analysis, most uh, particularly the core periphery terminology, had to do with the structural condition of being a periphery of the modern world system. Um, theoritizations of core periphery relations in Eastern Europe um, were even earlier than in the case of Latin American dependency theory. And interestingly, Emmanuel Wallerstein acknowledged that um, in, well, in several places, but in the introduction to world systems analysis from 2004, he even says core periphery is a crucial contribution of third world scholars. Well, some Romanian theorists in the 1930s uh, made the same contribution, but then again, Romania had the same structure as a third world country. This is an aside um, for an, an introduction to world systems analysis, but it is telling in linking um, kind of the fate, if we want to put it um, fatalistically, but the structural position, if we want to put it in terms of dependency, world systems analysis, and decolonial um, terminology, to see how um, structural positions are linked to the production of knowledge. I'll leave it at that. I think. Thank you, Manuela, for this uh, um, for this introduction. Uh, Ovidio, do you, do you want to also offer your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I'll just want to add that, uh, that indeed, um, just I want to add to, to what Manuela uh, has said that indeed, uh, the um, dependency theory and world system analysis uh, in conjunction with decolonial thought, uh, definitely helped us uh, uh, see the structural relations between distant geographies, right? And thus uh, already be in an inter intercultural field by necessity of research and not by simple comparativism. And um, that is a very important point uh, that still needs to be uh, further, you know, stressed out and unpacked, uh, the difference between simple comparativism and uh, uh, structural links or structural relations between peripheries and semi-peripheries. So that's the first point. And uh, it, it also, it, it also and this one of course opens a whole gamut of questions. Uh, as Manuela said, if um, the integration into modernity of both uh, uh, Latin America and Eastern Europe as regions uh, took place primarily by, coer by forms of coerced labor, then indeed the study of serfdom and of uh, uh, enslavement as forms of coerced labor uh, are, have to be then, uh, um, yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done in uh, uh, emphasizing the connections, the material connections and the structural connections in the world system and uh, in uh, the long durée of modernity. And now uh, a second point uh, I would make uh, um, as a sort of, um, 
transition towards our current times, namely that both uh, the colonial thought and the world system theory uh, and in this conjunction uh, have a very strong political uh, uh, lesson to, to, to offer us insofar as the transition, the post-socialist transition is concerned. Uh, if uh, we look at uh, the region of Eastern Europe uh, in the long durée and its uh, integration to modernity as um, well as a semi-periphery, then we can uh, also more clearly detail the process of integration after 89 as uh, a story of peripheralization. Uh, and uh, we can look for the common points, again, structural links between uh, uh, this uh, peripheralization in Eastern Europe and the peripheralization in other regions of the world. Um, thank you, with you. Uh, in fact, uh, when you were answering my questions, uh, you also raised some of the issues that uh, tie very well with uh, the second uh, follow-up question that I have, uh, which uh, relates to the notion of coloniality, and you both brought up uh, the importance of Latin America. Um, and you also, um, uh, also remind us in your work that um, coloniality is also different from and more pervasive uh, than colonialism. So both of you argue that the notion of coloniality, which is mostly applied to the case of Latin America, is also very useful to study uh, the, the European East in the past and the present. And Ovidio, you already mentioned your work on a post-communist uh, transition. So I would like to ask you to maybe elaborate on these points because you also um, look at uh, the, the region's integration into Western or Western-led institutions, such as the European Union, the World Bank, uh, IMF, and NATO. And maybe you can elaborate on, on how this notion also helps us to understand this process of post-communist transition. And Manuela, also in a similar way, you have also taken up this notion of coloniality to examine historically complex patterns uh, of free and unfree labor relations in Eastern Europe by comparing the emergence and operation of slavery and serfdom. Uh, so my next question to you is, can you elaborate on these points uh, a bit? Um, so shall we change the order over you? <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, uh, indeed, if coloniality, uh, if, if there's no modernity without coloniality, right? And if coloniality is indeed, uh, uh, we, uh, we, we accept it and we, we start to understand it in detail, in analytical detail as uh, a worldwide phenomenon, then it, this also means that coloniality is articulated in different manners in different regions of the world, right? And so, and in different time spaces of those regions also. So insofar as uh, 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 the post-socialist transition is concerned, we, this of course was the main, let's say, um, cultural archive in which I, I found the, the, the first time the necessity of, uh, of engaging with the colonial thought. Uh, since uh, what happened in, throughout the region of the former socialist bloc after 89, it was first a paradigmatic shift Indeed, uh, 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 this rare, real experience of uh, of, uh, of a radical epistemic transformation, but one that was not necessarily uh, uh, good, right? And um, one that uh, uh, needed uh, a special type of analysis, uh, right? That was not. Uh, uh, it was not enough to to focus on, let's say, social formations but uh, to look at the deep uh, undercurrents uh, uh, that were ch uh, affecting change, not only in the systems of knowledge, but also in institutions, as well as subjectivities on the way people uh, felt and uh, sensed after 89. And so looking at, uh, at uh, these other big major transformations after 89, it uh, uh, came clear to me that uh, there's, there were, we could uh, understand uh, this uh, mm -hmm. transition to capitalism as, uh, well, a vast process of uh, uh, destruction and social catastrophe. Uh, and that there was, uh, a, there was a kind of united or, or pushed together, driven by uh, a certain phenomena. And I identified anti-communism, uh, capitalocentrism, and Eurocentrism as uh, these forms. 
And it's important because uh, in, uh, by pointing to anti-communism, I meant not the criticism of totalitarianism, but anti-communism as an entirely standalone phenomenon that attempted uh, after 89 to rewrite the dominant narrative, historical narrative, to, uh, and to deny the relevance of local history, right? So in other words, uh, one, uh, let's say, proof of uh, the, the importance of coloniality, uh, of the relevance of coloniality in Eastern Europe is indeed anti-communism or the establishment of anti-communism after 1989 as a gateway uh, for the denial of uh, the relevance of local history, for the import of uh, um, uh, Western-centered uh, knowledges and for integration into um, uh, institutions of thought that are. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the intrusion. And for the um, integration, with the so-called integration into institution of thought and uh, uh, institutions of thought and institutions of. Uh, uh, that were Western-led and Western-centered. Uh, so the colonial thought were, uh, needed to be articulated uh, then uh, in a specific manners in Eastern Europe and, uh, uh, in order to develop the standpoint uh, of uh, somebody actually uh, thinking from the place uh, of where the, he, he or she is. And um, also, so, the, the relationship to, to the colonial thought in Eastern Europe in relation in the post-socialist transition uh, seemed a matter of uh, necessity again, uh, rather than uh, uh, an import or you know a fashion or what have you, uh, and that was true uh, and remains true to to the present. And uh, uh, we can see that criticism of capital centrism, of anti-communism, of uh, uh, Eurocentrism or Western centrism is uh, still incipient or let's say still needs to be developed. Thank you, uh, Manuela. Yes, I think um, Ovidio made several very important points, but this um, this one about coloniality now being um, just a fashion that was um, applied arbitrarily to another region than the one it was meant for is a crucial one, because um, again, coming back to the idea of um, a different way of um, seeing the global, not as comparisons between regions, but um, as interlinkages, connections, entanglements. I think coloniality as a concept and as a framework very much helps us do that. Um, because without coloniality, to put it uh, bluntly, so to say, without the understanding that colonialism is, first of all, actually not over, and that um, the hierarchies, labor, racial, and epistemic um, hierarchies, as well as political dependencies that were put in place through colonialism are very much still with us. Without this understanding, we are kind of condemned to perpetual newness. We have to constantly reinvent the wheel. There was the end of history, the end of, of colonialism, the end of communism, but there are still colonial territories out there, colonized territories by European powers out there. Um, there is still very much uh, racism and not in terms of a remnant, not something that we need to let die out because it's on its way out. It is very much sustained by um, a kind of thinking that uh, was put in place through colonial rule, through enslavement and through um, coerced labor. So in that sense, one of the first kind of variants of coloniality um, in the, well, maybe branches of coloniality, not variants that I was engaged in was the very notion of coloniality of labor that um, Aníbal Quijano had put forth, but um, had not very much detailed in order to see how we understand more about who is the subaltern. Is it the enslaved person? Is it the worker? Is it the um, coerced worker or the serf? Um, these tended to be fragmented realities and fragmented political struggles. I think seeing them through the lens of how the coloniality of labor of the capitalist world economy was denying, first of all, humanity to the enslaved and was denying the basic 
co-evilness, the way Johannes Fabian has put it, denying co-evilness, pretending or assuming that um, the coerced worker is from a past, from a different epoch, so that they can function in an economy that is feudally ruled while the logic of the system is capitalist. Helps us understand that this is a common struggle, and unless we understand it as a common struggle in terms of breaking away from many coerced forms of labor, not only historically, but also today, if we don't see it as a common struggle, we are condemned to um, kind of fragmented and basically um, contradictory um, struggles. So going against each other, a type of divide and rule. Um, we have um, Engels discussing the second serfdom in Eastern Europe um, as a continuation of serfdom uh, from feudalism. And in a way, kind of brushing away the fact that one was feudal and the other was capitalist. So the coloniality of labor makes us see that what links all the different forms of coerced labor was production for profit on a global market. And of course there was enslavement before and there was serfdom before and there were different types of coercion before, but not in the sense that the workers were denied humanity or they were denied co-evilness with the one putting forth the, that framework. And moving um, kind of more to the present also um, in terms of how coloniality uh, is helpful to think 21st century um, realities. I did mention racism already, and that unfortunately uh, seems perennial, um, hopefully not. Um, but I think the term coloniality of memory that I've um, used recently to refer to how some of the still colonized territories of Europe in the Caribbean are not seen as part of Europe or the European Union, although administratively they are, helps us see how you can have a reality on the ground. It is an administrative fact um, that the French Antilles and the overseas departments and territories of uh, the Netherlands, France, or, or, or Britain um, are just that. They are integral parts or associates to the EU, but you would never see a European Union discourse that addresses that as part of what it means to be Europeanness. And at the same time, you would have a discourse that says, well, in order to be European, you have to be in Europe. So for instance, Turkey cannot join um, the European Union because it's half Asian, but French Guyana is okay as part of the European Union, although it's in South America, um, because it's a legacy of colonial rule. The consequence, however, um, would be to see that um, Europe's Western borders are in the Caribbean and South America. That again, does not surface in the discourse because it would be politically inconvenient. So that is what coloniality of memory does. You can be the oldest colony of the West and stay a colony, even change name and no longer be called a colony, but something nice like an overseas territory or department, but you will not figure in definitions of Europeanness, modernity or civilization, and you will please not disturb European Union plans for enlargement. Thank you, uh, I would just I like to add one uh, another point sure. just to to, to uh, because I think this is a very productive uh, 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 angle in uh, questioning the coloniality in Eastern Europe. That um, adding to to what Manuela said about the the, the selective meaning of Europe that uh, coloniality keeps on uh, producing and uh, uh, disseminating, uh, it also produces a specific ongoing erasures. And uh, the for these uh, create contemporary, right, ongoing uh, cultural forms of oblivion uh, and internal divides. Uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, uh, not only of uh, the role of uh, Turkey into Europe. The, the very question: if if Europe is part, if Turkey is part of Europe, of course, if looked in a longer durée, is absurd. But uh, oblivions regarding, uh, uh, although in which ways remains to be discussed, of course but also uh, oblivion and erasure regarding uh, each, uh, let's say, East European state's East or each Europe and each European uh, uh, country's internal others, right? These are contemporary forms of erasure and oblivion that are associated not only with cognitive violence, but also with real violence, with 
uh, new forms of racism and uh, uh, xenophobia that have been produced, even if they had longer roots, they have been uh, produced and enforced in this process of the last three decades of uh, alignment into the Western project of civilization. Um, and this is a, 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 a part of coloniality that uh, manifests itself not only, of course, politically and academically, but in the relations between uh, p everyday people, uh, you know, in forms such as, you know, as soon as somebody, let's say, um, uh, from uh, even in a East European country steps into another, into the East of it, uh, it suddenly looks at that East with eyes of Western Europe, right? Uh, so it's, uh, it comes with uh, cultural forms that have real consequences. And that's a, a very important dimension of coloniality that uh, yeah, still needs to be unpacked in within the region also, not only in, uh, at the global scale. Well, uh, thank you both. Um, I would like to also remind our audience that you can send uh, us your question, uh, send us your questions. Uh, we will start with the Q&A uh, very soon. Um, so my ne next question is uh, about uh, the epistemic uh, dimension of uh, some of the topics we have discussed. So uh, Manuela, one of your arguments uh, in your uh, research is that the peripheralization of Eastern Europe in political and economic terms goes hand in hand with uh, epistemic violence. Uh, which is the silencing of critical theories uh, with anti-systemic potential. And relatedly, Ovidiu, uh, you explore how artistic practices can become uh, an epistemic space uh, for resistance and alternatives to capital and coloniality. So you argue that uh, art can fortify a, a form of regional internationalism and uh, solidarity. Uh, so can you maybe each elaborate how uh, periphery and periphery peripheralization relate to epistemic violence and also counter strategies uh, of resistance? So can I give the floor to uh, Manuela first? Um, so I think it's important to differentiate between the process of peripheralization and being a semi-periphery or a periphery, because um, we know the argument from post-colonial theory that um, the silenced societies of um, the periphery were the ones that never had a voice in um, the production of knowledge. They were kind of relegated in the intellectual or um, yeah, production of knowledge kind of division of labor to the status of um, recipients of knowledge from the West, from the core, um, and not as subjects of, of theory production themselves. But the semi-periphery or semi-peripheralization um, is a different structural position and a different process in that it is possible and a lot of um, people no longer um, reading World Systems Analysis, but just summarizing um, the critique of it, say, well, this is a um, static framework. You can either be a periphery or a semi-periphery, or you're the core. And that's actually the opposite is the case. It's a very dynamic um, system in which you can ascend from periphery to semi-periphery. Now, the um, point of view, the structural position, and the visibility of the semi-periphery uh, as for a long time this has applied to Eastern Europe, is a very um, productive and at the same time a very ambivalent um, position as the semi-periphery is the buffer, politically, epistemically, and economically between the core and the periphery, absorbing tensions between um, one and the other. And that tension means that on the one hand, um, a semi-peripheral um, region or country has a stabilizing function. If the world system was completely polarized, um, then why would it be stable? Why would it not revolt the periphery against the core in order to uh, upend the system? The semi-periphery promotes or and provides a kind of horizon of expectations. You can do better um, without necessarily just becoming the core. At the same time, um, this tension becomes or can become anti-systemic. And that for a long time has also been the uh, position of semi-peripheries. And again, here we have both Eastern Europe and Latin America, other regions as well, as 
those regions with very rich um, theoretical production, dependency theory in Latin America um, is, of course, one of the most prominent ones, but also a lot of critical theory, critical um, theory of capitalism in Eastern Europe that only gets a hearing once the peripheral position um, is upgraded to a semi-peripheral one. A periphery never gets hurt. A semi-periphery gets more visibility without having the privilege of having core dominance, but it gets more visibility, either in terms of the circulation of knowledge or because it has ascended to um, kind of semi-peripheral status. So basically, um, semi-peripheries benefit from two conditions. Not being the core means experiencing situations of political and economic domination akin to the peripheral ones and facing the need to develop theoretical and practical solutions to them. Um, so it's not some genius um, coming up with great solutions. It's a structural condition that prompts critical thinking um, that differs from a core thinking. But on the other hand, not being the periphery uh, means, and being the semi-periphery instead, that you have a certain degree of visibility in the production of knowledge, which peripheral areas, silent societies, do not enjoy. That's how I think it is, it's productive and it's worthwhile to look for the theoretical production, for instance, um, also you know, political projects such as the World Social Forum coming up in the Brazilian semi-periphery because it was possible to make it more visible and to um, attract more um, energy, political energy and mobilization energy to a semi-periphery than to a peripheral country. Thank you, Manuela. Um, Ovidio, can I invite you? Yes, thank you. Yeah, and uh, uh, picking up again uh, uh, from this ongoing long uh, conversation with uh, with uh, Manuela, these these points to the for 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 us for each uh, of us to uh, for the need of do engaging in a rereading of uh, the history of anti-systemic uh, movements. Uh, of course, we have uh, Marxism has a history of doing that. Uh, and we have a specific literature uh, engaging with that, uh, but there's a, a need uh, to go, for instance, into the longer durée before the so-called age of industrial revolution, right? And see the role and uh, the, the possibilities and the potential of anti-systemic movements, of ways of organizing the society and the community uh, specific to the region that uh, had uh, developed her life worlds and were either erased or their potential was stifled. And this is uh, a domain of, uh, let's say, not only historical research, but also of uh, political thought uh, that uh, again, remains to be done and remains to be done in uh, minding that it does not, um, its object of study does not respect the current borders of states. Uh, and uh, it has by necessity to develop in, uh, in uh, well, in an international and uh, uh, cross-border, let's put it this way, uh, uh, and intercultural forms, uh, cross-sectorial too, and uh, that, uh, and this is precisely what, um, to a certain extent, uh, artists have been doing uh, after, let's say, after '89, in the context of this paradigmatic shift, uh, of uh, in which, uh, well, if uh, the domain and the sector of culture uh, was demoted to the list of priorities in the efforts, uh, in the market-driven efforts, right to to the. Uh, orient uh, to create uh, local through shock therapy and other measures like that, um, a local uh, market economy. Uh, so if a culture was devalorized and demoted uh, to some of the last priorities, uh, that also gave a paradox, paradoxical advantage to artists and well, people willing to work uh, at the margins namely that uh, they had the, the let's say the free, there's freedom in that 
in not only doing work, but creating the conditions of one's own work. And that speaks again to this structural condition of semi peripheralization that Manuela was talking about, of this being not only a buffer, but of going both ways of uh, having a certain, let's, let's put it this way, a certain width of the meta, uh, I would put it <laughs> philosophically, you know, in the sense that uh, um, the, there's uh, 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 throughout the region a, a, uh, um, a, a strong history and a tradition of not only artists, but uh, uh, thinkers and uh, who are working not only uh, investigating their methodological assumptions also, not only the, their objects of studies. Uh, and uh, yes, indeed, artists after 89 are, uh, were uh, in these uh, um, conditions of precarity and production of poverty and production of devalorization. Uh, were uh, some of the uh, people who indeed uh, let's say, worked in an open epistemic space of uh, their own making, and thus managed to be the ones who both talked to people whose voices were silent, silenced at the time, and to show uh, uh, for the first time uh, uh, phenomena, important phenomena, and what it, they meant, like the, the massive migrant labor, you know, the racialization of uh, labor in Eastern Europe, typical uh, forms of racism emerging in Eastern Europe, uh, forms of sub subservience and uh, so on. So in other uh, words, social, social economical phenomena, phenomena that uh, uh, were basically documented and uh, talked about uh, yeah, by artists with a social invested agenda. Well, uh, thank you both. Uh, I, in fact, have a fourth question, um, uh, but we also have received a number of questions. Uh, so briefly, maybe we can uh, come back to my question about where uh, the empire and interimperiality stand in all these debates. And we discuss a lot about European colonialism, but in Eastern Europe, we also have the imperial history uh, of Ottoman Empire. And there is also a question about whether we can consider the Soviet Union uh, also along uh, these lines. And maybe, um, yeah, when we, if we have time um, uh, after we finish the Q&A, you can share your thoughts on this. Um, so I will start with a question uh, by Eric Burton, who asks uh, the interwar uh, Romanian Eastern European precedents of dependency and world systems theory are very interesting. Uh, so um, were there concrete channels of transmission between Eastern Europe and Latin America, certain persons, institutions that facilitated this exchange? Or, and might it be said that given uh, differing, dif differing ideological orientations of proponents of these theories, uh, for example, uh, minor less few, um, that insights about uh, semi-peripheral status may lead to very different strategies and visions of uh, struggle. So whoever wants to share their thoughts on this. I can take it if you want. So um, the, the question is right on point. Thank you so much. Um, because this is precisely what was not happening. There was no channel of transmission. Um, and the fact that some of these theories traveled um, has to do really with the ascent of um, Latin America to semi-peripheral status, paradoxically, because we're talking here about um, Eastern European um, thinkers and Manuel Lescu is one of uh, those that Wallerstein means when he says some Romanian theorists were uh, promoting the core periphery concept in the 30s, but Manuelescu is at the, at the very end of a very long line of thinkers who since the mid um, 18, well, 1800s uh, were talking about core periphery, not in the same terminology, but addressing structural dependency of the East of Europe on the West. Um, and the uh, channel of transmission ended up being Manuelescu because he wrote in French, uh, which was then uh, circulating in precisely what the question points to, a specific ideological um, fascist um, kind of understanding of corporatism, which Manuel Lescu uh, was promoting. And because of publication in French, it was translated immediately in Portuguese because it was important for a Portuguese 
discussion. And that's how it came to Brazil. Now, there is this very interesting uh, book by Joseph Love, um, Theorizing Under Development. No, it, the title is Crafting the Third World, Theorizing Under Development in Romania and Brazil, where he tries very hard to prove that Raul Prebisch um, had actually borrowed um, his understanding of um, kind of corporate free and then later an equal exchange from Manuelescu, but he cannot find evidence. Uh, but it's so kind of clear that there must have been some communication because it's all there. So in a way, corporatism, fascism in the 30s were the facilitating context, but we couldn't call it a channel of communication because it has to do with the fact that at the time that these discussions were flourishing in Romania, the East of Europe and Romania in particular were peripheries, not semi-peripheries, zero visibility, plus Romanian language. Translation in, into French, plus circulation to semi-peripheral Latin America, kind of made for the spark, but of course you also need a specific structural context and it was there uh, in Latin America at the time. And that's how some of these discussions acquire visibility. Perfect, okay. yes. I would, I would add that this also shows, I mean, uh, not only that there's, there was no uh, direct channel of transmission and you can talk about uh, uh, <laughs> then, uh, um, how this is related to, to the, the whole of a region uh, ascending to the, the semi-peripheral status. But also, if we look at, at the interwar period, uh, we, we also notice how important this notion of imperiality is indeed. If we look at the way, for instance, uh, the, the communist and socialist groups agitating in uh, the peripheries of the Habsburg Empire uh, worked, for instance, around the Forwärts journal of Jakob Pistina in uh, Chernovitz, uh, where not only where we have um, a, a Jewish, Romanian, uh, Slovak, uh, Czech people uh, converging, so the peripheries of the Habsburg Empire converging in a conversation about uh, well, social justice and uh, a different system. And so uh, uh, the direct channel of communication that was uh, created in spite of it all, right? It was uh, between the peripheries or, uh, or, or the, the peripheralized uh, 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 peoples and regions within uh, uh, the empire or, or who were subjected to, to the um, uh, Habsburg Empire. And this, at, at its turn, had a, a, a direct influence, of course, and on on uh, the Vienna Revolution, on Red Vienna, yeah, and Austro Marxism. Um, thank you. So we have a question about some of the terms uh, that are used. Uh, for example, one question is about the origins of the terms uh, post-socialism and post-communism. Um, so, um, yeah, how do you uh, feel about uh, these terms? Um, but there are also critiques of uh, these terms by several scholars, both from within and without uh, the region, for instance, by Mikhail uh, Bukowski. Um, so how can we approach these terms or should we also problematize their usage? Uh, I'll go about post-communism, I mean, you can go about post-socialism. <laughs> so uh, I used uh, post-communism because, um, and the term post-communist transition a, a few uh, times, because uh, I think this is what was presenting itself, this dominant movement to be the end for once, for all, you know, the final judgment on communism. Where for, so, so the main ideological thrust, but also material in terms of, you know, uh, what were the materialities that were devalorized, uh, dejected, cut and thrown, you know, to the dustbin, uh, sold for scraps and all that. All, the, all this is, was what uh, uh, were the re remnants of communism, right? And uh, hence the post-communist uh, transition. Of course, the term is uh, uh, anachronic since you know, as Romanian artist Ciprian Moreshan uh, reminded us, communism never happened. Uh, but um, uh, if we we focus on, uh, let's say, an analysis, a cultural cultural studies uh, of uh, dominant ideologies, right, at the point where ideologies are meta, where sense 
takes beings, right? Like uh, structures of feeling are being uh, uh, disseminated, then uh, yeah, I think post-communism uh, is uh, justified, but uh, only within those frames, yeah. Yeah, I am also skeptical of both, and Ovidia has uh, said a lot already about post-communism. I think already with post-socialism, we had a discussion that was prompted, as the question was was pointing to, actually, that it was um, an, a label imposed from outside, um, first of all, and in a kind of fashion in the context of a fashion where there were many posts so this was the new post it was the after the postmodern it was uh, one that it seemed um, to just logically follow but what the term does is that it holds in place a category um, for each for which there's no other name uh, and it leaves us into a perpetual transition and it might have made sense to speak about post-socialism um, in 1990 and maybe 1995 but what does it say about 2021 that now we are um as we're, we're approaching a time period that is almost as long as uh, some state socialist regimes um lasted in some regions but the transition is still just a transition. So it's, I think the term reproduces an understanding of the East of Europe as a perpetual bridge. It's not a destination. It's just a transition to something else. It's like the carrier pigeon or the donkey or the, it's not a person or it's not a destination. It's not a subject. It's a post-socialist, a post something. Um, I think it's, it's a trap um, categorically terminology, terminologically and, and politically, um, let alone for the fact that, as Ovidio pointed out, not only communism never happened, but socialism uh, is not a useful label if the post-socialist that is attached then to it doesn't make uh, clear that what we're talking about was state socialism. So there was no Eastern European socialism, there is no global socialism, this was not socialism. So what is post-socialism? What is the post? Then it's even less clear than the post in post-colonialism, um, but that then is another topic. Well, thank you both. Um, so we have very good questions. So I'm going to combine two questions about um, uh, maybe uh, an invitation to both of us to approach these terms center and periphery in a more critical uh, sense. Uh, so the question by uh, Tamara van Kessel um, is asking, um, is there not also an idealization of the European core that is being maintained and fed within the periphery by local actors for various reasons to distract attention from internal injustices, to project longings on, etc.? Uh, so the periphery, is it only a victim or can we talk about also complicit actors? Um, and this ties with a question by also a colleague uh, from, uh, from, from the Netherlands, Hugh von Barr, uh, who is asking about the concept of nested Orientalism. Uh, for example, can this concept also help us to maybe go beyond this dichotomous understanding uh, between uh, center and uh, periphery? So, Ovidio, maybe can I invite you? Yeah, sure. So first about, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, of course, this is uh, part of uh, the, the, let's say, the legacy and the workings of coloniality, right? That we, let's say, are implicated to a certain extent, right? Uh, and so that delinking the, the issue of decolonization uh, is uh, is put uh, differently uh, in different uh, standpoints and positionalities. And in uh, the transition to capitalism and uh, uh, Europe, the European Union right after 89, of course, uh, well, an important uh, part was um, the collaboration, the direct collaboration or the changing of minds and souls uh the colonial mimicry and the internalization of uh, uh of ways of understanding of and of knowledges uh that happened uh, not only i mean my work i try to document that it uh, how it happened not only at the level of the elites so first of all the 
the intellectual uh, elites, the um, selection of anti-communist dissidents who were uh, um, allowed, let's say, free movement in the Western world after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Uh, uh, so they, of course, uh, um, had an important role in disseminating uh, uh, this type of, uh, well, if not comprador, then at least uh, a, a, a mimicry, right? Uh, but uh, we have also structural uh, uh, phenomena that produce this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, local implication. One of them that I tried to emphasize was uh, this uh, this um, coincidence that uh, the 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 process of this Western oriented process of the former socialist bloc after eighty nine coincided with the dissemination of the technologies of cable television and uh, satellite the DBS uh, television uh, throughout the world, so that basically. Uh, every uh, regular common uh, people, they had uh, all of a sudden after 89, not only they didn't experience only a political shift, but also uh, they became consumers of uh, Western uh, uh, TV uh, channels and of Western uh, TV culture industry to such an extent that we can talk about well, let's say, for instance, about the Romanian American perspective, right? Uh, the internalized perspective on, of America, of Romanians watching American realities on TV, right? Uh, with, uh, with a lot of uh, thirst, right? Uh, so you have issues of implications, you have issues of co collaboration, and of course, of uh, comprador and opportunistic, uh, 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 let's say, uh, gameplay at stake. And all of these uh, uh, paint uh, yeah, parts of the, the, this uh, landscape of the transition uh, after 89, yeah. Insofar as ne the nested Orientalism are concerned, um, yes, I mean, uh, uh, we've, uh, uh, this, there's so much to, to talk here, of course, uh, because uh, the, the whole process, this whole process has been uh, just replete with examples of nested Orientalism in every and each region and uh, internally and uh, externally, intern with internal other so for, uh, and with the external other to the east or to the uh, south. And uh, this, this again uh, leads us back to this issue of uh, the, the, the new forms of uh, racism that have been um, uh, 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 created not only uh, uh, that took root, strong root with, on the background of this process of uh, civilization uh, that was exclusively Western oriented and assumed a hierarchical divide between indeed between uh, the, the, the core and whatever else is outside the core. These are great questions. Um, so the short answer to Tamara van Kessel's um, question is periphery mean, does periphery mean only victim is no. Um, obviously the core periphery um, diet is only to be understood as a relationship, but the relationship is not one of oppressor and victim. Um, it is a dynamic one, and this is where the semi-periphery comes in and becomes important to understand, not only as the structural position that absorbs the tensions from one to the other, but also one where um, this kind of nested racializations are performed. And, and that's where Bakich Hayden's concept um, comes through. Um, and I think it makes a very good um, case study for how um, understandings of Westernness, civilization, Europeanness, or whatever, um, are perpetrated better by those to whom they are denied, because you would have Eastern Europeans being the most fervent upholders of Europeanness, uh, Christianity, civilization, not just when it's about keeping Muslim refugees from entering Europe in 2020. Uh, or 2015 since then, um, but um, even claiming a return to Europe after 1990 um, in the name of having upheld Christianity and having kind of staved off the Ottoman invasion into Western Europe. So this is the claim to fame of Eastern Europe. It only 
means that this complicity with um, racialization uh, principles makes um, the understanding of Western Europeanness as whiteness and as Christian more powerful because it is kind of uh, trickled down literally <laughs> to the periphery or to the racialized other. And I, I think although, um, for instance, Maria Todorova's um, concept of, of Balkanism is um, directed against a, a mere replication of the concept of Orientalism for Eastern Europe, it's not really that um, contradictory to the idea of nested um, Orientalism because when Todorova says, unlike um, the um, Orient that was the West's other, Eastern Europe and the Balkans were the West's incomplete self. This is the same in-betweenness that is connoted by the structural position of the semi-periphery that is connoted and, and actualized by replicated racism and in a way is put in practice by nested Orientalisms. We were discussing yesterday in another event how a um, geographer named Oki in 1905 was saying Europe is the only continent with a west and a center but without an east because and nobody wants to be the East. So everyone claims that they're in Central Europe or Central Eastern Europe, but never in Eastern Europe because it's so, it has such a bad reputation that all of a sudden you're in Asia and you've never been in Eastern Europe. Um, so um, that's kind of the way nested Orientalism works as a replication of racism, whiteness, and Christianity. Um, thank you both. Um, we have uh, time for one last question, if you don't uh, mind. Uh, and uh, the question is from uh, Christine Krause. And Christine is asking um, whether you can maybe share your thoughts on the extractive logics within la labor migration in today's Europe, which became uh, more visible during uh, COVID-19 and, for instance, the care corridors care workers from uh, Central and Eastern European countries were channeled across close, close borders to secure labor force. Uh, so can we speak about neocolonialism within Europe um, or is it uh, is this watering down uh, no, the discussion? No, Christine, uh, I asked the question already. Um, so do you want to share your thoughts about uh, labor migration across the European Union? Manuela? Yeah, um, great question. Uh, brings coloniality into the present, I think. Um, and that's already my answer to the second part of the question. Can we speak of neocolonialism within, within Europe? We can, but I don't think it illuminates much if we make it new. Because um, the way in which it was possible to mobilize, instrumentalize um, workers, both care workers and agricultural workers during um, the start of the pandemic to still travel and to still not be protected and still um, have even less rights than they used to have within Western Europe, um, but still be sent by their governments is because we have such a sedimented history of these exclusions and um, kind of exploitations into which this new pattern fits. It doesn't matter that it's a pandemic. It doesn't matter that uh, borders are closed. They were closed before, but for different reasons. It was dangerous before, but for different reasons. If you have a population, if you have target groups that were always the ones um, more prone to accepting um, less conditions, and that's not an individual attitude, but it's a structural position, and it's um, kind of upheld by weaker governments, um, as in the case of the Romanian government that did nothing to prevent Romanian workers from being sent to pick asparagus in Germany or strawberries in Spain. Um, it could have, it could have insisted on uh, better conditions or better pay, but that's not what a semi profil state does uh, within, a, within a structure in which it begs um, for privileges or is not in a negotiating position. So I think this is very much coloniality of labor um, and not so much neocolonialism, just to make the, an um, the answer short. Yeah, I agree with Manuela on this point. Uh, basically, if we look, uh, uh, first of all, as uh, in the smaller time frame but still be before the the pandemic 
uh, you have uh, the transition to capitalism, uh, meaning uh, a devastating loss of populations for Eastern Europe. And if we look at the social pyramid, is uh, we're talking about active population. Uh, so for instance, in Romania's case, uh, there's about 3 million people less now than uh, in 1991, right? And uh, so what this means, of course, this, this, uh, this catastrophe of warlike levels, basically, that uh, it has been a slow, a slow going violence, right? Is uh, not neo-colonialism, of course, but as Manala said, uh, uh, a continuation of structures uh, that were put in place uh, uh, a long while ago, and that were maybe reactualized in different forms. And uh, in relation to that, uh, of course, you know, if we are to reverse the the, the stand the the standpoint, right, the perspective. Uh, it's it's still hard to to for instance to uh, make to 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 make one uh, uh, accept within let's say Romania that migrant labor is what has made Romania as a society after eighty nine even for people who have not migrated right it's such a systemic phenomenon at levels uh, 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 you know so so big that. Uh, it has uh, crossed everybody. So when the pandemic hit, and as uh, Manuela said, not only that the state didn't do uh, uh, anything to protect the workers, but uh, it has facilitated, uh, even in the times of lockdown, uh, special uh, airplane trips, right? To ensure the, the continuous flow of cheap labor towards uh, uh, the core, then uh, I guess uh, at least the pandemic made visible this structural change that have existed. And especially it has made visible, uh, as you mentioned, Beste, the, the importance of the East European care workers to, the, to Europe in, as a core uh, after 89, right? This uh, invisibilized history because a care worker is usually an individual woman who takes care of the elders or the kids, right? And so uh, it is uh, one of the most uh, invisibilized categories of labor that has come to fore uh, during the pandemic through self-organization. Uh, in the case of Elena Popa, a care worker from Vienna who uh, started uh, organizing the, uh, in, in these conditions uh, with uh, with other care workers to and to to uh, to try to bring to focus the visibility the issues concerning uh, this very important category of you no know, of essential workers and um, again this this uh, uh, shows not only the well you know all these uh, women have a background a very different backgrounds some of them are teachers some of them are um, you know, have finished only the high school, some of them, they have very different backgrounds, but they are uh, uh, all doing care work. So this points to this, this narrowing of, uh, of possibilities and uh, this uh, uh, process that is restricting uh, uh, and having uh, uh, also very important consequences back home that are to be considered uh, not in a, in a, in a very in a time frame of the present but in a time frame of generations right since we have uh, uh, all these children right who are uh, raised without parents or, or um, with their parents away Well, thank you both. So we have reached the end of our session. Thank you a lot for this very rich and interesting discussion. I, I myself have learned a lot and I wish we had a couple of uh, hours more uh, to discuss further. Um, and I hope to continue our conversation uh, through on-site on activities, hopefully uh, very soon. I also would like to thank our audience for very, very insightful and very, very good questions. Um, so um, with this, I uh, finish uh, this session. Uh, please check um, our website uh, for the previous events and also updates about uh, the upcoming events. Um, and uh, hope to see you in one of our upcoming events. And I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you and be well. Take care.